910, Big 550, KTRS. Our next guest is an author. It's going to be here in town on Wednesday, St. Louis County Library for book signing and a book reading. I have the pleasure of emceeing the event at the county library for a book signing and a book reading. He's one of my favorite authors I am uh, not related to. He has written such great books as The Last Stand, the story of the Battle of Little Bighorn. He wrote the book about the Mayflower. He wrote a book called Why Read Moby Dick, which is one of the most interesting conversations I've ever had on the radio. His uh, book now is out in paperback called Bunker Hill. He's New York Times bestselling author, Nathaniel Philbrick. And Nathaniel, welcome back to Big 550 KTRS here in St. Louis. Oh, it's great to be back with you. You got it. And uh, again, to, uh, Wednesday night for book signing and a book reading. Bunker Hill, New York Times bestseller, uh, A City, A Siege, and A Revolution. When we talk about Tea Party today, and anytime somebody mentions Tea Party, it always brings me back to the original Tea Party yeah. and Bunker Hill and uh, Lexington and Concord, and that was sort of, that's where it all started, kind of. It is. It's where my book begins. And what's interesting is, you know, I grew up thinking that the Tea Party was because Britain wanted to throw this huge tax our way, and uh, and we said no. And the funny thing is, Britain actually reduced the price of tea, so it was it cost less. There was a tiny tax on it, but uh, many of the Boston merchants had been smuggling in illegal Dutch tea at a low price, and now the British tea was lower, so they decided to use their patriot ideals. And uh, thus we had the Boston Tea Party, which is kind of an interesting way into this story that, you know, we think we all know, but it turns out to be quite different. from. Uh, hold on a second. Hold on a second. You're telling me that they lowered the tax on tea and then they threw it all in the harbor? They actually lowered the price. It was a, a, a English monopoly that sold the tea, so they could pretty much set the price they wanted to. And so they, uh, they had all this surplus of tea, so they decided to lower the price by a third. So it was cheaper than it ever had been, but they added a, just a tiny little tax. And, uh, and so it was a principle that led the patriots to throw uh, the, the tea into the water. It wasn't the price of the tea. It was cheaper than it had ever been. And, uh, you know, so it's kind of an interesting twist on, on uh, uh, what most of us uh, thought of as, as the, the terrible tax that, began the Tea Party. A lot of great names that have survived uh, to today are in this book. Was Sam Adams a part of the Tea Party? Well, you know, Sam Adams was someone uh, that was everywhere. If there was one person that sort of had his finger on the pulse that would uh, lead to the revolution, it was Sam Adams. And he, pr he wasn't there on the docks when it happened, but he clearly had a lot to do with everything that led up to it. And, and so... Uh, he was the presiding presence, really, when uh, it came to the revolution exploding in Boston. The The book is called Bunker Hill. Uh, Nathaniel Philbrick, our guest, he'll be in uh, St. Louis County Library Wednesday night for a book signing and a book reading. How did you go? This is why you're so good, because um, you go back and you find things. How did you go about researching this book? Well, there's kind of a, a two-step process. Uh, with every book, I plunge into the archives, and when it came to this one, there's all sorts of places in the Boston area, the Massachusetts Historical Society, the Bostonian Society that has the stuff. But uh, I also try to get on the ground and, and go to the places. And, and Boston today is almost unrecognizable uh, when it comes to what it was like in 1775 when it was just a little island, 1.1 square miles, connected to the town of Roxbury by this thin neck of land. And so uh, but still, if you walk down what's called Washington Street into downtown Boston, you are following uh, that one road into Boston from the old times. And, and there's the Old South Meeting House where 5,000 people met prior to the Boston Tea Party. And, you know, there is the old, the old uh, state house that's still standing. And so it was a process of putting together the archives and, and going on the ground, if you will, and, and scouting out the places. Uh, did anybody ever say, don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes? Well, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that there is not a direct, you know, clincher on it. We do know that someone said the, the, the British soldiers had white splash guards on their feet called half gaiters, 
pilots that were white. And we do know that one of the officers said, do not fire till you see the whites of their half gators. And that doesn't quite have the poetic <laughs> ring of the whites of their eyes. But um, the point is, though, that they were that that very easily could have been said. The Patriots didn't have a lot of gunpowder, and they were going to make sure every shot counted. So they waited until the Redcoats were as close as 30 yards, uh, which took an extreme amount of discipline to wait that long until they were that close, and then they fired to devastating effect. How hard was it to look at it from 21st century eyes? Because in 1775 and 1776 and 1777, it was a different world. Absolutely. You know, and that's the way it is with uh, all historical uh, you have to get da- back there in that time, and there's a tremendous tendency, particularly when it comes to America, where we look to the past, to the founding fathers, and kind of cherry-pick from it and say, to try to support our current views today. But the fact of the matter is they had a totally, their sense of liberty, their sense of, of freedoms was very different from ours. You know, we think of personal liberty. They were thinking of the community, of the right to own property. And uh, it, the fact, you know, they weren't thinking in terms of an individual's rights should be protected. Uh, they were thinking in more of in terms of a community. And so you have to be careful. You have to really do as mu- best you can to get back into the time uh, and see it in that context. And, but that said, uh, there's a certain universality uh, to human experience. And I think that's the, the, the thread that makes it so interesting to go back in the past and, and see the similarities and the differences. There are also people and tell me if I'm wrong, um, but were there not people who were born in America but yet were sympathetic to the English crown? Absolutely. And, you know, and that's an- there was another, I think, a surprise for a lot of people. I grew up being taught, you know, if, if you're a patriot, you're good. If you're British, you're bad. And, uh, and never the twain should meet. And the fact of the matter is, in the beginning, most people didn't really care. And really, they wanted it to stay the same because at the going into the revolution, uh, the American colonists were the the freest, least taxed people in the British Empire. They really didn't have that much to complain about. And there were many families in Boston who had sympathy, who loved the mother country and didn't see, didn't think it was justified to break away. And so you see families that were torn apart, where a brother would go one way, uh, another brother would go another, and find themselves fighting each other, uh, you know, on the day of Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill. And so uh, there was an ambivalence there that's been kind of written out of the story that I think it's important that we recognize, that how difficult this was. It was a very personal thing uh, when it came. It wasn't just ideology. It was who you knew, who you cared for, and who you didn't like that steered what side you ended up on. How much was it? I mean, you look now at, like, you know, Kosovo and Bosnia, and that, that they try and sort of separate from their past and sort of build a future, and yet they're still sort of beholden to the past, and the old arguments die hard. How much, you know, how much, well, how much, quote-unquote, terrorism was there? How much, you know, was there a bomb blew up in the town square, or how much was there actual, you know, gunfights from two neighbors who had two op- opposing views. Absolutely. Well, you know, that happened. And, you know, we, we kind of grow up thinking it was all, uh, I, you know, eloquent speeches in the Continental Congress that led to what happened. But, no, there was real uh, what we would call terrorist activity. The, my book begins uh, after, in the months after the Tea Party with a tar and feathering in downtown Boston in which a, uh, a loyalist named John Malcolm was uh, – taken, dragged out of his house, uh, stripped of his clothes on the coldest night in January uh, when Boston Harbor was completely frozen, snow surrounding, and hot tar poured on his naked flesh uh, in the center of town, feathers smeared all over it, and he was taken uh, from place to place throughout downtown uh, Boston, uh, beaten uh, to within an inch of his life. Uh, and, and when it finally, the next day, when he was dropped off at home, the flesh began to fall off the ba- his back in, in hunks. He would survive. Uh, but, uh, you know, this kind of thing was happening in the streets of Boston. Nathaniel Philbrick, our guest, is New York Times bestselling book, Bunker Hill. It's now out in paperback, and he'll be in St. Louis. Don't tell me there's nothing to do in St. Louis. For a St. Louis book signing and a book reading, it's Wednesday night at St. Louis County Library. Who is Joseph Warren? Joseph Warren was the the great man of the revolution in Boston that no one's ever heard of. You know, we've all heard of Paul Revere, 
John Adams, John Hancock, Samuel Adams. But it was a, a 33-year-old doctor named Joseph Warren, a widower with four kids between the ages of two and eight, who was the mastermind of, of this. Uh, the, uh, Sam Adams and John Hancock were away from Boston uh, when things happened. It was Joseph Warren, this 33-year-old doctor, who gave Paul Revere the orders to alert the countryside that the British were coming uh, in the days after Lexington and Concord, in which he then fought in uh, later that afternoon. Uh, he was elected president of the Provincial Congress. Uh, he was uh, became a, a major general, and if he hadn't been killed during the third and last British charge uh, in the Battle of Bunker Hill, he might have been one of the founding fathers we revere today. I mean, he was, uh, you know, that important to the revolutionary movement, and he was swashbuckling, uh, el eloquent, and just a fascinating character. Yeah. Uh, what was the one thing, Nathaniel Philbrick, that you were in the catacombs of some history museum by yourself at three o'clock in the morning that you turned the page and you said oh my goodness i can't believe i found this well you know it's it is, it's little moments like that 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 make it happen and i have to say it had to do with joseph warren and it was a uh, speech he gave uh, uh on uh Oration Day, which was a, a, cell, a memorial service for the Boston Massacre, which had happened uh, five, four years earlier. And uh, he delivered this speech uh, in the Old South Meeting House before 5,000 people. Uh, 5,000 people, that, you know, that's a third of the population of Boston was in one place. And he delivered the speech, and there it was, written out in his handwriting. Uh, and, and it's just amazing. And it was while well, reading that paragraph where it just came, came to me that, you know, this is a guy who is in the middle of it. You know, he was in the middle of, of all of this happening, and he delivered the speech, get this, dressed in a toga. <laughs> because, you know, togas represented the Republican ideal of liberty. And so this is a guy who was a revolutionary, but he had this dramatic flair for the theatrical. And uh, so he's just a fascinating character, and to be reading that speech, um, you know, in his handwriting, was really an amazing moment. Uh, John Adams, Samuel Adams, John Hancock, Paul Revere, George Washington. Did you ever let your mind wander if these guys were alive today to see what their experiment has become? It's just, I mean, you wonder what these people would have thought. Yeah, I think I think you know it, that's a interesting thing to contemplate and you know what you asked earlier about how it was a different time and uh, I think our time now is so different that you know blood would probably trickle from their ears if they you know listened to the music uh, saw airplanes going back and forth you know the, the the speed of travel and yet you know what I think um, particularly the ones that were involved in the making of of the Constitution, like, you know, Washington, who'd seen the revolution through and then saw the political process happening. I think that, you know, if they were went to Washington, D.C., and in the halls of Congress, uh, tears would come from their eyes to just see what they created. Because to have a democracy, to have what we have for so long, for all these years, um, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. And uh, they could never have thought that it would be as successful as it was. I mean, they all dreamed it would be. But, you know, it, they pulled it off, and subsequent generations have pulled it off. And I think you know, it is amazing um, uh, uh, what began uh, in so much duress. And, you know, and no one knew what was going on. No one knew where it was going to lead. Uh, the fact that it's created a country uh, that has been as stable as even though it doesn't necessarily seem that way to us, right. is truly amazing. Your book, In the Heart of the Sea, which was about, was that about, it was about Nantucket, but that also included the whole Moby Dick story, correct? Right. It, it, it's, it's about the whale ship Essex, uh, a real live uh, whale ship that was sunk in the Pacific in 1820 by a huge sperm whale that rammed it. And it was the story of the Essex that inspired uh, Melville's climactic scene in Moby Dick. And, and where Moby Dick ends is where the, the, the real story of the Essex begins, because once their ship goes down, they then take to the whale boats and go on a, a voyage back to South America that will take more than three months and, and lead to starvation and dehydration and all that kind of stuff. And, and so that's the, the, it's in the heart of the sea is, is also uh, a 
really a survival tale. Right. And now, while you were researching that, did Bunker Hill sort of come up with that research from, from time to you time? Know, it's interesting. Uh, in the Heart of the Sea uh, led me to the book Mayflower, which you referred to earlier. And it was with Mayflower where, because um, I, I wanted to write about New England, the beginnings of America. And it was with that book that I realized so much of, of what happened with the Pilgrims and with the subsequent generation. Uh, I, that book ends with the King Philip's War of 1675-76. And I realized in writing about that, that what happened 100 years later in the American Revolution, almost precisely 100 years later, had so much to do with what was being fought uh, uh, 100 years before. And so it was those three books kind of led me uh, to, to bunk, you know, they're, they're in a way, they're, they're of a piece. Yeah, interesting. Uh, the book is Bunker Hill, A City, A Siege, A Revolution. Uh, our guest, Nathaniel Philbrick, will be at St. Louis County Library, 7 o'clock for a book signing and a book reading. And one of my favorite conversations ever on the radio is our conversation we had a few years ago after you wrote the book, Why Read Moby Dick? Oh, well, you know, uh, that was a great conversation, and that book for me, uh, it's, it's a little different from the others. It's, it's more personal, right. and, uh, you know, and I was an English major rather than a history major in college, and so uh, literature has always been important to me, and Moby Dick is kind of the, the personal Bible of mine, and, and, and so, uh, you know, that, that was a fun book, and, and it was, it was, that was a really great conversation. After that conversation, the people came up to me, and it was so interesting because the people who came up to me who said, I love Moby Dick. I said, I had no idea you would be a Moby Dick fan. And people I would think would like it said, I, I couldn't get th through four pages of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it, yeah, it is that. It's, it's kind of like a Masonic uh, a handshake, you know. It's one of those things, you know, the people that are Masons, you never thought they would be kind of right. thing. And, yeah. and it is that secret kind of knowledge. Yeah, and Herman Melville is born, uh, I learned this when I was in uh, New York last time. He's like born like right there on Wall Street, right? Absolutely. He, uh, you know, he grew up as a New Yorker. I mean, he really did. And so, uh, uh, you know, we think of him with uh, the Berkshires where he wrote Moby Dick, but he w it was really uh, New York City uh, yeah. where, you know, his formative influences. Yeah, uh, right there. Were, yeah. Uh, Nathaniel Philbrick, Wednesday night, we'll see you there. I get to MC it, so thank you for letting me uh, chime in on your uh, night at, at St. Louis County Library. I look forward to it. I, I, I do, too. You got it. Have a safe trip, and we'll see you Wednesday. Okay, see you soon. Nathaniel Philbrick, the book is called Bunker Hill, and uh, he'll be at St. Louis County Library. And if you love history, there's no one better than to sit and listen to uh, talk about the history because, as you heard him, he's uh, held all these guys right in his hand as he researched all these books, including his uh, newest one, which is now out in paperback, called Bunker Hill. Wednesday night, St. Louis County Library, 7 o'clock. We'll see you there. 927, Big 550, KT.